Jesus in just a couple of words? Maybe if you could only pick three words, how would you describe it? Maybe you would say something like, well, it's complicated. Following Jesus can be a little bit complicated sometimes because we face decisions in our life that maybe there's not a, a clear Bible verse for, and so following Jesus, maybe it can be complicated, or maybe it can be scary at times, maybe in the day and age that we live, and we look at uh, the rights, the freedoms that we have, and, and they're not for sure. You know, We don't know if we're always going to have them, and so following Jesus can seem a little bit scary at times, but I want to think about what it was like to follow Jesus before we jump into our subject this morning, I want to think about what it was like for the followers of Jesus in the first century. Now, I have a pretty good idea of what they would say, uh, what it was like to follow Jesus in just a couple of words. I think they probably would have said confusing. Uh, the teachings of Jesus, uh, and uh, Jesus often taught in parables, and he was kind of breaking the mold. I mean, the, his followers were made up of Jews, mainly that, that grew up in that society, being taught the Jewish religion and they were memorizing the Torah, and they were immersed in this culture, but now they're following someone who is breaking that mold, teaching something else entirely. I think they would say it's a little bit confusing. And we also get that from the questions that they constantly ask Jesus. They would say things like, we've always heard this, but how come you are saying this? Or how come everybody's saying this about you, Jesus? And how come you're saying this? Or what does this parable even mean? Or maybe they thought following Jesus was just incredible. I think maybe we forget sometimes that what we have with the Bible is a piece of God's mind. Meaning that the miracles that we read about in the Bible actually happened in history. That means that someone actually walked on the water. That means that first there were actually demons that went inside people and that there was people casting demons out of other people. It means that there was a man capable of healing the blind, raising people back from the dead. And if you've been going to church for some time or maybe you were raised in the church and somehow, I don't know how it's possible, but somehow we'll read this or we'll hear it in a Bible class and we'll go, yep, yep, it happened. It's incredible. But can you imagine being the followers of Jesus that witnessed this happen right in front of their faces? Following Jesus was probably pretty confusing at times, probably pretty incredible, but also probably pretty scary. As we mentioned, Jesus was one that was breaking the, the social mold, and he made a whole lot of enemies. And if you read about the conversations that Jesus had with the, the religious leaders, namely the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, there were a lot of sense situations that they found themselves in. In fact, right before the event that we're going to talk about, if you'd like to go ahead and turn your Bible somewhere, you can go to Matthew chapter 17. We're going to talk about the transfiguration. The transfiguration was this pivotal moment in Jesus' ministry. And you can kind of look at the transfiguration like a bind that holds the Old Testament and the New Testament together. But before we get into that, I want you to look at the events leading right up to this moment. In chapter 16, Jesus finds himself in conversation with the Pharisees, and the Pharisees are like, Jesus, show us a sign from heaven. And so Jesus says, you evil and adulterous generation. Can you imagine being one of his followers then? You're standing there as the guy you're following around is talking to these very powerful religious leaders, and he calls them evil religious leaders, and he calls them an adulterous generation. If you remember what happened to those that committed adultery in this time, they were dragged out, and they were killed, and they were stoned. I want to know what it was like. I want to know the look on their faces as all the crowds, maybe they gasped or sighed, and the, the, the disciples that are following Jesus around are like, oh, could you said that just a little nicer? Or, or maybe just not so on the head. I mean, we agree with you, but we didn't know you were going to say it right in front of everybody. Or as Jesus is walking away and they're following Jesus, they're like, yeah, I know, sorry, we're, we're with him. And they're kind of like moving their way through the crowd. I mean, there are events that are taking place that as a disciple, yes, it is incredible, but also had to be pretty scary because now you're lumped in with that guy. You are now a part of his new teaching and his flipping the world upside down. 
But what's incredible to me about this is if you look in the same chapter, Matthew 16, this is when Jesus asks Peter, who do people say that I am? And Peter says, well, some say that you're Elijah. And then Jesus says, well, who do you say that I am? And he says, you are the Christ, the Son of God. And Jesus says to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but from heaven. This knowledge that you have, this that, that you've come to understand, is, is not from people, but it's from God. And what's so amazing to me is right after this, you have the transfiguration. And I want to point out something here. All right, so Peter makes this confession. You're the Christ. You're the Messiah, the anointed one. Some say that you're Elijah, but I know you're not. And then about six to eight days later, Peter interrupts a conversation that Jesus is having with Elijah and with Moses. He just interrupts. Have you, if, you, if you look through this account that happens, when Elijah and Moses show up on the, the transfiguration, it says that Jesus began to talk with Elijah and Moses and Peter, of all people. If you look at his life up to this point, it really shouldn't surprise us that much. But Peter decides this is a pretty good time to interject and say something while Jesus is talking to Moses and Elijah. And he steps in and he says, it's good for us to be here. Really, Peter? That's what you're going to say at this time. It's good for us to be here. And then he wants to build them those tabernacles to keep them around. You have this account repeated in Matthew chapter 17, in Mark chapter 9, and in Luke chapter 9. The transfiguration. And all of them have these little bits of details. So I'm going to try and string them all together and just tell you uh, the account. You can fact check me in those places. We're going to stay in Matthew 17 for the most part, though. So... Jesus makes this statement to some people right before the transfiguration. He says in chapter 16 of Matthew, he says in verse 28, Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. What we have is pretty incredible. The Bible. It was a book that was written, uh, it was compiled together about 1,300 to 1,500 years. I mean, that was a long period of time uh, where this book was being compiled together. You have 40 plus writers that all went in on this Bible project and they're inspired by God and then you have all these writings, all these prophecies and the whole book is completely unified. But the event that we're talking about, Transfiguration, has been used by some skeptics and critics to try and either cheapen the identity of who Jesus was or to basically say that the Bible can't be trusted because look at the discrepancies that you can find. So before we continue on with this event, I want to just debunk. It's a fun word to say. We're going to just go through two of them uh, that people say about this account here. Some say uh, that this can't be true or that the Bible can't be trusted because Jesus makes the claim that his second coming is going to happen before some of those people standing there will die. Well, Obviously, it's been a long time. Those people are dead, and Jesus had come back. Therefore, the Bible can't be trusted. Well, this is not true, mainly because they have a misunderstanding of the word uh, kingdom here. It's not talking about the second coming in that way. But you can also look at it as the transfiguration that happens right after this. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. But I want to just show very quickly before we move on uh, an illustration that shows how incredible the Bible is. The fact that we even have the Bible. All right, so this was on the spot last night. I was trying to come up with an illustration uh, to prove how amazing the Bible is. That's pretty hard to do, but I finally decided, hey, Janelle, help me with this. And I said, okay, there's a make-believe guy named Dan. Now, here's what I want you to do. Janelle, we're both going to write down, here's what we're going to agree on. First, his name's Dan. We're going to write down his place of birth, his build, like generally what he looks like, his profession, the impact that he made on the world. That's what we're going to write down about this guy named Dan. So we agreed on all of those things. And I said, okay, well, I know Janelle pretty well. She knows me pretty well. We might get some of these things right. So I haven't read this at all. <laughs> and she said, don't you want to read it before you get up there? You might embarrass yourself. And I said, ah, well, wouldn't be the first time. Uh, so I'm going to read you. So let's just pretend mine is uh, the New Testament and Janelle's is the Old Testament. This is what Janelle says about Dan in the Old Testament. Dan is going to be born in Mississippi. 
All right? <laughs> Way off. And here's my prediction. This is the New Testament. Dan, place of birth, Canada. Way off there. <laughs> okay, all right, let's go back to the Old Testament. Dan, his build is going to be about 5'5 five, five and slender. Oh, I said he's going to be average and athletic, which if you want to make the difference there, athletic and slender are a little bit different, and 5'5 five, five is pretty average, though. Okay, all right, cool. All right, so <laughs> his profession, he is going to be an engineer. Let's see if the prophecy came true. His profession, airplane pilot. Nope. All right, the impact. Wow, Janelle wrote a lot uh, about an impact. I was looking for like a couple of words. <laughs> All right, let's just start with Dan. The impact, the difference he's going to make in the world. Ready? Here we go. He took it upon himself to review designs of transportation structures all over America, like bridges, train tracks, ETC. Uh, and he thought that they may have some errors in the, de the design uh, when they had first been designed and built, and so he corrected those designs, and he took them to the appropriate people where every error and safety hazard was corrected, corrected which w has undoubtedly saved hundreds of millions of lives. He refused to ever take one penny for his work, Dan, starting uh, stating that he just wanted to help people today all major universities use his work to teach engineering and architecture students the import oh architecture students the importance of preventing small errors in design that could result in the unintentional deaths of so many. Again, a lot more than I was looking for, but how detailed. And Dan sounds like a great guy. Let's see if the prediction comes true. All right, this is who Dan is supposed to be. The prediction. All right, the impact he made on the world. Dan invented the slipper. All right, now let's take that and let's look at the Bible. Me and Janelle were in the same room at different desks. We even agreed on the guy's name. And we said, this is what we're going to write about, his place of birth. We're going to write about his build, generally what he looks like. We're going to talk about his profession and the impact he's going to make on the world. Now look at the Old Testament. If the Bible took 1,300 to 1,500 years to compile all together, people that are either just recording the history of things that are happening right in front of them or making predictions, sometimes even naming the name of the king that's going to reign, Cyrus, in Isaiah. And you have all of these predictions, and all of them come, through, come true, and then you have Jesus who fulfills all of the prophecies made about him after years have passed. The Bible is incredible, and it has survived the test of time. But then you have some critics who will open up and they'll say, hold up, we found an error. Matthew chapter 17, verse 1 says, after six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John. And then what about Mark chapter 9? It says, and after six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John. But then you get to Luke's account in Luke chapter 9, and it says, after about eight days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John. What happened? You have six days, six days, then eight days. Well, I don't think you have to go into the Greek. I was looking at this, uh, but I don't think you have to go into the Greek just because Luke's account says about eight days. But if you do look at the Greek, the word is Jose. It's not Spanish. It's Greek. But the word is Jose, which means approximately. Now, if you look at the style of writing that Luke has compared to Matthew and Mark, Luke loves the word approximately. In fact, if you look at Luke and Acts, the two books that, that Luke wrote, he uses this word approximately 17 times. Matthew uses it about five times. Mark uses it like twice. And so he uses approximately because Luke is not so concerned about the details. That's not the point. But you can also look at it in a way that... that Luke is also talking about about eight days, and he's taking into account two days before when you have the confession of, of Peter uh, to Jesus and all of this, and then Matthew and Mark are both starting right at the transfiguration. Six days later, this is what happened. Either way, no discrepancies here. The Bible is incredible. It's an amazing piece of literature. It came from God's mind. I think everyone here agrees on that. So let's move on with transfiguration. Okay, so Jesus takes Peter, James, and John. You have the inner circle. There are the 12 that follow Jesus, but then you have this inner circle. 
and they go up on the mountain by themselves. And it says, he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, his clothes became white as light. And behold, there appeared Moses and Elijah. And so you have this conversation where uh, Jesus and Elijah and Moses are having uh, their own conversations, which, which we're not privy to. It's so disappointing uh, that you don't get to hear what Jesus is talking to them about. And then Peter interrupts and says, you know, it's great for us to be here. I'm going to build you guys tabernacles. That way you stick around and have somewhere to live. And after, while, while Peter is still talking, this cloud rolls in, engulfs them. A voice out of the cloud says, this is my beloved son. Listen to him. And if you were in this situation, what would you do? Probably exactly what the disciples did. They fell on their face. They were terrified because of everything that's happening. And then the hand of the Savior, Jesus reaches out, touches them and says, don't be afraid, stand up. And when they do, it's only Jesus. It's a very incredible event that takes place. Jesus walked up the mountain with them looking like a carpenter looking like someone that wasn't really all that special. I mean, he, he looked like the average Jew. And so he's walking up this mountain looking like a completely normal person, but he's been telling, he's been telling them that he is different. And they have seen his miracles, but they haven't seen his true form. And Jesus gets up there, and then he is completely transformed into something else. And for a moment, they get to see Jesus and his glory. It's interesting when you look at the two people that show up, Elijah and Moses. And really what the, the main point of the transfiguration was for them, is a, a powerful uh, visual illustration, was Moses represents the law. Elijah represents the prophets. So you have the law and the prophets show up, and then the voice of God comes in and says, this is my son. This isn't Moses. This isn't the, someone that created uh, the law. He's not just a prophet, which some people said that Jesus was. No, this is my son. Listen to him. And I think there is a very powerful visual when they look up, they no longer see Moses and Elijah, but just Jesus. He's the answer. If you could sum up what the transfiguration is all about in just one short sentence, it would say, Jesus is better than everybody. Jesus is better than Moses. Jesus is better than Elijah, down to what he was wearing. Now, I was reading through all of the accounts of the Transfiguration just to look at some of the details. And I would encourage you to do the same thing, if not for any reason but the one I'm about to show you. Go to Mark chapter 9. <laughs> Me and Janelle are laughing about this just because of uh, how strange it is. Okay, Mark chapter 9. I'm just going to start reading uh, from Mark chapter 9, verse 2. In six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John and led them up on a high mountain by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. All of the accounts seem to write this like it's no big deal. And he was transfigured before them. No more details than that. Just like, give us some more. But I want you to, to uh, see what Mark has to say. Verse 3, And his clothes became radiant, intensely white, as no one on earth could bleach them. I love that detail. That is so amazing to me. Mark just decides to include this. So white, no one on earth could bleach him like that. I don't care how good of a cleaner you think you are or what product that you saw on some infomercial, you cannot bleach your clothes or get them to be as white as what Jesus is wearing. Why do we have that detail? Why does Mark decide to include that? I think it's because of that phrase he uses, as no one on earth. No one on earth. Jesus is so awesome, so powerful, so better, or he's so much better than Elijah and Moses, even down to what he's wearing. The clothes that he's wearing, not of this world. Jesus is God. Jesus is better than Elijah and Moses? Well, because the voice of God the Father comes out of the cloud and says, this is my son, listen to him. Jesus is better. Jesus is the answer. They're walking down the mountain, and I want to look at a few lessons that we can pull out, because that, those, that's what the transfiguration was really all about for those people. It's, it represents the old law and the prophets. They're no longer a thing. Jesus is going to fulfill 
uh, all of the law. Jesus is better than all of the prophets. Jesus is the way for everyone. And it is the bracket that holds the Old Testament and the New Testament really together. It brings it all to a head. But I want to look at some practical lessons for us, maybe, that you haven't considered coming from the transfiguration. The first one is a lesson on swallowing your pride. When you get to Matthew 17, verse 13, they're on their way back down from the transfiguration. And so the disciples have some questions. I mean, after what happened, I'm sure they had a million questions. But they say, Jesus, how come all of the scribes, remember, they grew up Jewish. They grew up hearing all of this. This is what was indoctrinated into their mind. Jesus, how come all the scribes say that Elijah was supposed to come first before the Messiah? That's the end of Malachi. I mean, it basically ends with, there's a voice crying in the desert. It's, it's John the Baptist. He's about to come onto the scene, but they describe him as Elijah. And so Jesus explains this. He says, Elijah already came, but people killed him. People didn't pay attention to him. They, they killed him. They did whatever they wanted to with Elijah. And it says the disciples understood that he was talking about John the Baptist. Now, that may not seem like such a big deal, but you think about the disciples and how they grew up and the society that they grew up in, totally indoctrinated with this Jewish belief. And yet when they say, hey, how come all the scribes say that Elijah is supposed to come first? And Jesus says, he did come. You just missed him. You didn't see him. It was John the Baptist. He already came. It says they understood. The word there means it's a, a turning of the mind. That's humility. That's swallowing your pride right there. Even though they believe something their entire life. How many people in America really struggle with that? As far as, as their pride getting in the way of even logic or truth and what they see right in front of them. Oftentimes our answer is, that's not what I've heard growing up. That's not how I was raised. That's not what my parents always told me. That's not the church all my friends go to. I mean, it's like no matter what, what we see, sometimes our reaction is, I don't like the way that makes me feel. I don't like the way that sounds. And yet the disciples, when they hear something pretty life-changing about what they've heard their entire life, it says the disciples understood what Jesus was talking about. The disciples, their mind, when Jesus said it, they, they knew that, that Jesus was the Son of God. When Jesus said it, their minds began to change. They thought, all right, well, Jesus said it, it's true. Let's keep on going. And of course, they had several questions after that. But another lesson that we can learn, so the first one is swallowing your pride. The second lesson we can learn is on patience. You have this conversation that happens between Jesus and Moses and Elijah, and I can only guess what they were talking about, but I have some idea. I mean, it could be Jesus was explaining the plan, I'm the Messiah, I was the one that was going to come all along, and my plan is to be the ultimate sacrifice. Now, if you remember what a, a big part of Moses and Elijah's life was, it was the sacrifices. They saw a lot of bloodshed from a lot of different animals that were continually being killed on account of the sins of the Israelites. And yet Jesus says, I'm the answer to that. I'm going to be the ultimate sacrifice for everyone. I'm the coming Messiah, but I have to die. I mean, there could have been a lot of things that he was talking about with them, but I also wonder if it had something to do with maybe the fact that both Elijah and Moses went on a quest to see the glory of God. If you remember in Exodus chapter 33, Moses is up on top of the mountain, kind of having a hard time with being a leader of all the Israelites. And then he basically begs God, God, show me your glory. And God takes Moses and he puts him in the cleft of the rock. And then he turns his back to him. And then he's able to see that little bit of God's glory. And on the way back down the mountain, Moses' face is glowing. He didn't even know, which I don't I don't know how you don't know when your face is glowing. <laughs> but he's walking down the mountain, his face is glowing, everyone freaks out because the face of Moses, their leader, is glowing, and so they put a veil over his face. And that wasn't even him being fully in the presence of God. But that was after he begged God to see his glory. God knew that the glory, his glory would strike Moses down. He would die. He didn't get to see it. But you also remember in uh, 1 Kings chapter 19, 
after chapter 18, when you have Elijah saying, if Baal's God, follow him. But if Jehovah's God, then follow him. And then God strikes the altar that's been soaked by the prophets of Baal. It goes up in flames. And then Elijah pulls out his sword and kills all of these prophets of Baal. And then he takes off. He's on the run for his life. He's in the wilderness, and the angel comes and then gives him sustenance and food. And then as soon as he's revived, he just keeps on running, which I found very strange as well. He's like, thank you for the help. That will fuel my fear. And then he just keeps on going. And he climbs up the mountain to look for a sign from God. He's hiding. And God comes in the wind and the earthquake and the hurricane. And all of these powerful things are happening, but the voice of God is not in any of those things. But then God shows up in a whisper. Moses and Elijah, both looking for the glory of God, both looking for a sign, both looking for some assurance here, but they don't get to see it. Elijah gets to hear the voice. Moses sees the back of God, maybe. We don't even know how much he really saw. It just says that God turned his back to Moses. But now, having a conversation with them is the Son of God, glowing bright white, in his, his, this, this transformation that's taken place, having a conversation with them, they could have been talking about a whole lot. Point is, Moses and Elijah could not see the full glory of God, and yet they still clung to God with everything that they had. Yet they still followed God, yet they still made this great impact. I want to point you to a verse that we talked about in uh, the teen class, actually, last Wednesday. It's a verse that I think about pretty often. It's 2 Corinthians 4.17. 2 Corinthians 4.17, uh, Paul's writing, and he says, the affliction that we're going through right now, any persecution that we're going through right now, it's momentary, and it's a light affliction. And if you notice the, uh, the, the wording that he uses, talking about the coming glory, he says basically this momentary affliction that we have, this life that we're going through, it's very short, and it's preparing us for the weight of, of the glory to come. That's incredible. The weight of the glory to come. This life is preparing us for a weight, a glory that is so incredible we can't even comprehend it. That's what Moses and Elijah were waiting on. They didn't get to see God in, in all of his glory. And you know, we get to read how everything happens. We get to read the Old Testament. We get to read the New Testament. We get to see the life of Jesus. The disciples had all of these moments in which they doubted because they're like, are we really wanting to change the entire way that we grew up and everything that we've known to follow this guy that we're not totally convinced is who he says he is? And they go through all of these doubts, and the Israelites obviously had to go through all of their doubts from being indoctrinated in Egypt, and yet they still clung to Jesus. We get to see the full picture. We get to know. Paul tells us through inspiration Everything that you're going through this life, it's going to be very short. It's going to be very brief. The glory to come is going to be so amazing you can't even fathom it. There's been a lot that's happened this weekend. Uh, I thought about preaching a political sermon. I've never done that in my life, probably never will. I'd like to stay out of it. I got a lot of ignorance when it comes to that stuff too. So, probably, and it, most of it would probably be a conspiracy theory. But uh, I know that whatever happens in this nation and in this world is a momentary and light affliction. It's not going to be forever. Life is a vapor. Sometimes we forget, we get caught up in the weeds, and I think the transfiguration is one of those events that help us to kind of step back and look. Look at, look at the two people that were brought back from the Old Testament, all the trials and things that they went through, and yet they're there with Jesus. The plan is still unfolding, even though for a while it convinced a lot of people that uh, God doesn't really know what he's doing. They're in the wilderness. They think they're going to die of thirst. I mean, there, there were all these times when God himself was questioned, and yet it's all brought to a head right here. God knew what he was doing the whole time. Jesus knew what he's doing. There's going to be a glory that's coming that we have to prepare for. And that's what we have to think about. And that's what our minds need to be focused on instead of maybe some current events. If you've been struggling with doubt, maybe on who Jesus is, his identity, if you've been struggling in your Christian walk somehow, or maybe... You have been thinking about baptism, but there have been some things holding you back, like maybe that's not how I was raised. That's not what I'm used to hearing. Similar to what the disciples were going through. 
If there's something that you're struggling with this morning and you'd like to change that and start either start that relationship with Jesus or fix that relationship with Jesus, you can do that today, right now as we stand and as we sing.